Thank you. We turn now to First Minister's questions. we will start with question number one from Ruth Davies. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and to wish everyone in the Chamber and across the country a very happy new year and offer them the best wishes for 2017, and to ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Well, let me also wish you, Presiding Officer of the Chamber, and everybody across Scotland a very happy new year. Uh, later today, I will have engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Ruth Davison. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We've heard a lot this week about performance in health systems. I think we should all be able to agree that nobody should revel in sick people struggling to be treated anywhere. Instead, we should all be focused on patients and how to improve care. And that's why I welcome reports this morning that the Scottish Government has brought in a team from the NHS in England to help out the troubled Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Glasgow. So can I ask the First Minister how many other Scottish hospitals have benefited and continue to benefit from such arrangements? First Minister. Well, there isn't a team from the NHS in England helping in the Queen Elizabeth. There's a support team uh, provided by the Scottish Government uh, helping the Queen Elizabeth Hospital deal with pressures in A&E. Uh, there is an input to that from a very uh, small team, two people, I think, from a commissioning provider in the north of England. But this is a Scottish Government support team um, and it is making sure that the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, just as is the case in hospitals across Scotland, uh, are dealing with the increase in demand for A&E services at this time of year. It's worth saying, presiding officer, that our A&E services face challenges, particularly in the winter months. And these are challenges not just faced in Scotland, but across the UK. Our staff are doing a sterling job in dealing with those challenges. The most recently published figures for the week ending the 1st of January show that out of every 100 patients, 92 were seen within the four-hour target. That's broadly similar uh, to the same week last year, despite a &E attendances being up by almost 3% since the same week last year. Now, obviously, my concern, my responsibility is for Scotland, but I think it is important to say that due to the actions that we have taken to support accident and emergency departments across the Scotland, our NHS is coping better than the NHS in other parts of the UK. And the Chamber doesn't have to take my word for that. Let me quote Professor Derek Bell of the Royal College of Physicians when he says Scotland is consistently performing eight or 10 percentage points better than England. So there is no complacency in this government when it comes to A&E or any other healthcare services. I have visited three different health boards this week alone, but we will continue to support our health service and our A&E departments to make sure that they continue to deliver the services that patients deserve. Yeah. Ruth Davidson. Presiding officer, I asked how many hospitals were benefiting from such arrangements as the hit team brought into the Queen Elizabeth. And as the First Minister chose not to answer, I'm sure that the Chamber looks forward to her fuller updating us at her convenience on exactly how many have been so served. And we know there have been a series of problems at the Queen Elizabeth since it opened. And we know that this team that brings in lots of different people, including people from south of the border, has been in place for a number of months. But what we don't know is its precise remit how long it has been asked to stay for and what cost has been incurred to the Scottish Government. So can I ask the First Minister, what has been the total cost over the past five years of hiring specialist teams from other parts of the UK to help the NHS in Scotland? First Minister. We provide, we as the Scottish Government, provide appropriate support to health boards so that they can continue to improve services and deliver better services to patients. Perhaps if the government in the rest of the UK was doing similarly, there would be better A&E performance across hospitals in England. As an aside, the latest figures for England on A&E have been published just this morning. They show a further decline in performance, and they now show a gap between performance in Scotland's A&Es and performance in England's A&Es of 10% percentage points. So let me say very clearly, presiding officer, uh, the NHS in Scotland will continue to use and learn from best practice in the delivery of health care, wherever that best practice exists. 
But let me also say this very clearly, presiding officer, and there is no complacency on the part of the government. We will continue to see demand for a &E services increase during January and the winter, as we always do, and that undoubtedly will be reflected in performance. But if there is best practice in the NHS in terms of A&E anywhere in the UK right now to be learned from, it is best practice in the NHS in Scotland. You know, I quoted Professor Derek Bell earlier on. I don't know if Ruth Davidson's seen what he's written in this morning's Scotsman. He talks about uh, the better performance, the consistently better performance in Scotland than in other parts of the UK. And he says that this is in part due to the national programme, Six Essential Actions to Improve Unscheduled Care, which shares best practice and appears to be showing patient benefit. And he then suggests that the NHS in England should consider introducing a similar national plan to the one already operational in Scotland. So we do have best practice in A&E services. That best practice has been delivered in our hospitals here in Scotland. Ruth Davidson. Presenting officer, I simply asked for greater transparency in health spending. And as a former health secretary, I would have thought that that was information that the First Minister would have been happy to provide for the Chamber. It seems not. Of course, presenting officer, the Queen Elizabeth Hospital is not the only new medical facility with teething problems. In 2014, the First Minister announced to much fanfare that new trauma centres would open across the country. They were supposed to receive their first patients last year. But yesterday, the Scottish Government announced that the new centres would be years late. The First Minister admitted that they would be at least three years late, and the only explanation offered was scale and complexity. Communities have been expecting these centres for two years and now been told to wait at least another three. I think they deserve a fuller explanation than the one given, and so does this Parliament. So will the First Minister give us it now? First Minister. Let me... Before we move off uh, from the first part of Ruth Davidson's question, she talks about transparency in health spending. Let me give her transparency around health spending in Scotland. We have record levels of health spending in Scotland as a result of decisions taken by this government. That record level of health spending is delivering record numbers of staff working in our health service. And those record numbers of staff are delivering A&E performance in Scotland right now that is 10 percentage points better than A&E performance in England, and even further uh, than that uh, compared to Wales and Northern Ireland. So we will never be complacent about the performance of our health service, particularly during these difficult winter months. Uh, but let me take the opportunity, presiding officer, to thank each and every one of our healthcare teams across Scotland who are doing such a fantastic job on our behalf right now. In terms of... In terms of uh, the trauma centres uh, that I was uh, very proud to talk about yesterday, including £5 million of investment in the next financial year to support this commitment, we have rightly taken time to get this right. Ruth Davidson and others will be aware, should be aware, because many of their own members have been part of this Absolutely. intense debate about the correct number and configuration of major trauma centres across Scotland. And Ruth Davidson would have read in our programme for government uh, published in September last year, the commitment that we would, and I quote, conclude the preparatory work by the end of 2016. That's exactly what we have done. We'll now go on with implementation, um, but it's important to be clear what we're talking about here. We're not talking about creating from scratch four new facilities that currently don't exist. These four hospitals in Aberdeen, Dundee, Glasgow and Edinburgh already provide excellent first-class trauma care. What we are talking about is continuing to enhance what they do and to join up the services they provide with the services that other hospitals provide and with the service that the Scottish Ambulance Service provides in an integrated trauma network and that work will be done on an ongoing basis over the next three years many of the improvements that are part of that will be delivered over the course of this year including key improvements to the trauma service provided by the scottish ambulance service so this is about ongoing improvement to already excellent services that are being delivered by our trauma care staff across the nhs and i was delighted to talk to the staff delivering that service in nine wells yesterday and let me take the opportunity to thank them for the first class outstanding job that they are doing. Yeah, yeah. Ruth Davidson. 
So not just late, but also significantly scaled back from the party conference announcement. But, presiding officer, there is another point here. And that once again yesterday, we saw this Scottish Government bypass Parliament and go straight to the media regarding a major change. And it's been reported that the Health Secretary is not due to update Parliament on the delay to these trauma centres until October, meaning that MSPs will not have a proper opportunity to fully question the reasons behind this decision for nine months. And I think that's clearly unacceptable. The Scottish Conservatives have requested that the Health Secretary comes to this chamber to give a full statement on the delay, and I ask the First Minister to ensure that that, that takes place next week. First Minister. Yeah. Officer, can I point out to Ruth Davidson that I'm standing in the chamber right now answering questions from her on major trauma centres. So, if she can't get any or all of the information about this announcement that she wants, then I would suggest that's about a deficiency in her ability to ask questions, not about any lack of information from the Scottish Government. Can I also say to Ruth Davidson, two further things about this. I didn't go straight to the media yesterday. I went straight to Nine Wells Hospital to talk to the staff who deliver trauma centres across this country. And incidentally, there was an IPQ published at the same time informing Parliament as I did it. Secondly, Ruth Davidson clearly doesn't know much about this subject. She talks about scaling back. Can I say that when I talked about the intense debate about the number, that was about the fact that there were people who thought we should only have exactly. two major trauma exactly. centres exactly. based in Edinburgh and in Glasgow. We didn't think that was right. So what we have committed to are four major trauma centres as part of an integrated network. Further evidence of this government getting on with the job of delivering first-class healthcare services. And finally, presiding officer, I do say it's a bit rich for Ruth Davidson to come to this chamber and talk about the health service. In the week that the Red Cross has accused her party of presiding over a humanitarian crisis in the health service in England. So I'll go on with the job. I'll go on with the job of supporting our healthcare staff in doing the great job that they're doing in providing health services across our country. I can see members are in quite a rowdy mood. But if you could just please show some restraint. Kezia Dugdale, question number two. Happy New Year, President Officer. Uh, to ask the First Minister <laughs> what engagement she has planned for the rest of the week. Presiding Officer. Engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Kezia Dugdale. Last year, I met with leading consultants and surgeons at the Aberdeen Royal Infirmary. They told me that a new trauma centre in Aberdeen could be the difference between life and death for people in the North East. Whether it's someone in a serious car crash or an accident on the rigs, they were clear. Having access to world-class trauma care could be a lifesaver. The SNP promised the trauma centres would be open in 2016. But yesterday, the First Minister announced a three-year delay and she looked like she was celebrating that delay. Given what the experts tell us, does the First Minister accept that this delay could be a matter of life and death? First Minister. At Aberdeen and Dundee major trauma centres will actually be fully operational as major trauma centres before the ones in Edinburgh and Glasgow, probably over the next year to 18 months. So Aberdeen is getting the life-saving major Absolutely. trauma centre that actually some people thought it shouldn't get at all because there should only be two based in Glasgow and Edinburgh. But I think it is important because this is really important. These major trauma centres as I said, are not brand new facilities from scratch. These hospitals are already providing excellent trauma care. And this is about enhancing what they do, firstly, but also secondly, and this is the crucial part, and perhaps uh, the part that is not fully understood. It's about joining up what these four centres do uh, with the work that other hospitals do in other parts of the country, and crucially, with the work that the Scottish Ambulance Service will do in an integrated trauma care network. That's the really important part. Uh, one of the early uh, parts of implementation of this will be the provision of a 24-7 trauma desk within the Scottish Ambulance Service so that patients are 
are triaged more quickly and get to definitive trauma care as quickly as possible. So this is not just about four centres. This is about a network of trauma care. It's going to deliver even better care for trauma patients than is already delivered. But let me stress, these hospitals are delivering first-class care already. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and also the life-saving medics I met told me what they are telling the government more delays will cost lives. And I listened very carefully to the First Minister's response to Ruth Davidson. In fact, I wrote it down word for word. She said, we are rightly taking time to get these right. She said, we are ensuring the correct number and the correct configuration. Why then did her government uh, release a press release on the 2nd of April 2014, which says, and I quote, the four bases will be operational from 2016? First if she'd looked into all of the detail of this, would know the answer to her own question. Because after that, after that, there was another report that cast doubt on whether that was the right yeah, configuration. Exactly. And we had to look again to make sure we were taking account of all of the clinical evidence to make sure that we were getting that right. That's why uh, what I said is absolutely the right thing, that we took time to make sure we're getting it right. And now these improvements are underway already. Aberdeen already delivers life-saving trauma care. The improvements that will take place will enhance what it does, enhance what Dundee does and Glasgow and Edinburgh, but crucially make sure that they work together in that network with the appropriate support of the Scottish Ambulance Service. These are the right changes. Uh, they're being taken forward for the right reasons. The other part of the announcement yesterday, which hasn't been talked about enough at any point, is the focus on rehabilitation. This is not just about saving lives. It's about making sure that people who suffer serious trauma get the rehabilitation they need to have a quality of life as well. So this is an integrated approach. It's the right approach. It's now based on the right evidence. The Chief Medical Officer has taken forward the work to get us to this stage, and we're now going to go on and implement it. Kezia Dugdale. You know, I, I also listened very carefully, President Officer, to the First Minister's response around the problems facing England's NHS. And I think it's quite incredible to hear the First Minister say that we should celebrate the fact that the Red Cross hasn't condemned our NHS. What happened to the high ambition that the First Minister had? And you know, do you know, there is an unhealthy theme which follows the SNP and their NHS election pledges. Patients were promised world-class care at the Queen Elizabeth and they just aren't getting it. People in the North East were promised a new trauma centre but they are years behind schedule. This health secretary promised to abolish delayed discharge yet now we know 700 people have died waiting to leave hospital. Targets are being missed and dedicated health service staff are telling us they are under pressure like never before. Why is it that the only consistent thing the SNP delivers is broken promises on the NHS? First Minister. Ke Kezia Dugdale's comment about the Red Cross would be fine if it was actually what I had said. Uh, what I said we should be celebrating in our NHS uh, with no complacency is the fact that our hard-working staff in our A&E departments up and down the country are delivering an A&E performance against the four-hour target that is 10 percentage points ahead of the performance of hospitals in England and even further ahead of the performance of hospitals in Wales exactly. and Northern Ireland. And as I also said, you don't have to take my word for that. That is the view of the experts, and I quoted exactly. Professor Derek Bell of the Royal College of Physicians. I think we should be proud of our NHS staff for doing that, but of course we should continue to support them given the challenges that they face and will continue to face throughout the winter. Uh, Kezia Dugdale also uh, mentions delayed discharges. Uh, again, this morning we see uh, evidence in England of a steep rise in delayed discharges. Over the last year, while we have got much, much more work to do, we have seen a 9% reduction in the NHS bed days lost to delayed discharge. I said earlier on, I've visited three different health boards this week, um, and in the people I've spoken to in each of these three health boards, they talk about the improvements around the six essential actions 
in a and &E, but they also all talk about the benefits that are starting to be felt from the integration of health and social care, getting people discharged from hospital earlier. And we're the only government in the UK that stopped just talking about integration of health and social care. We've actually got on and done it, and the benefits are starting to be seen. So yes, there is much more work to do, but we'll continue to support our NHS in doing so. And finally, presiding officer, I will say this to Kezia Dugdale, and I know she doesn't like it, and I know she's trying to pretend it's not the case. This government was elected on a commitment to increase resource spending in the health service by £500 million, more than inflation, over the life of this parliament. Kezia Dugdale's commitment in that election was just to increase health spending by inflation. Yeah. If Kezia Dugdale was standing in my place right now, the health service would have less money than it does. That's why she's got a cheek to come and ask the questions that she's doing. We have a couple of constituency questions. First, uh, Murda Fraser. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Yesterday, the fourth road bridge was closed for most of the day causing massive disruption to the lives and businesses of thousands of my constituents in Fife and those further afield. I'm sure the First Minister would want to join with me in commending all those who worked so hard yesterday in very difficult conditions to get the bridge reopened as quickly as possible. However, it will not have escaped the notice of my constituents that if the new Queen's Ferry crossing with its wind shielding had been opened in December, as the First Minister previously promised, they might well have been spared this disruption. So can the First Minister tell my constituents today when the new Queen's Ferry crossing will be open? First Minister. Well, actually, to get to the facts of this, if a driver hadn't ignored the warnings not to take an HGV onto the bridge, the bridge wouldn't have been closed yesterday. The contractual completion date for the Queen's Ferry crossing is, of course, June this year uh, and we're on track to make sure that the Queensferry crossing will be open uh, on track uh, and of course the Queensferry crossing is being delivered under budget and I want to thank all those who are working hard on the new bridge just as I do want to thank all of those who worked really hard yesterday in some of the most uh, difficult con weather conditions uh, that we see at this time of year to get the bridge repaired. It was a very complex repair. They got that done. They got the bridge open at nine o'clock last night. And I think all of us uh, should say a heartfelt thank you to them for that. Gail Ross. Thank you, President Officer. I would like to put on record that I am a PLO to the First Minister. I'm also the MSP for Caithness, Sutherland and Ross, and a number of my constituents are outside the Parliament today, setting out their opposition to ship-to-ship -ship oil transfers in the Murray Firth at the mouth of the Cromarty Firth. I share their opposition. The decision on ship-to-ship -ship is one for the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency and the UK Government. Would the First Minister join me in urging the MCA to listen closely to the views of my constituents and to pay close attention to the potential environmental impact of ship to ship if it was allowed to go ahead. First Minister. Well, can I thank Gail Ross for the question? Uh, she rightly points out that this is not a devolved matter, despite the Scottish Government have uh, repeatedly make, made the case uh, for these powers to be devolved. Uh, on the basis of the current information, the Scottish Government is unconvinced that ship to ship oil transfers uh, can or should take place at anchor in the Cromarty Fifth without resulting in an unacceptable risk to the marine environment, uh, in particular a European designated area uh, for bottlenose dolphin. Uh, we will ensure that the concerns of local communities are heard by the UK authorities while, as I said earlier, continuing to press for the relevant powers to be devolved to Scotland. We will continue also to support the Cromarty Firth Port Authority, which is a vital and valued part of the economy of the north of Scotland. The MCA, in my view, has a duty to listen to these concerns and to the local people who, as Gail Ross has said, are represented at Parliament today. Finally, presenting officer, can I say uh, I warmly welcome uh, those who are outside Parliament today, and some of them may be in Parliament, uh, to uh, Parliament. Let me assure them that the Scottish Government uh, absolutely hears their concerns and will continue to do everything we can uh, to make sure those concerns are heard by those taking the decisions. Uh, but perhaps once they leave Parliament today, uh, it may be good advice to them to stop off at the Scotland office um, and make sure that the UK government is also hearing uh, their concerns. And I hope their concerns will be listened to there as well. John Lamond. 
Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware of the disappointing news that the Jim Clark rally in the Borders will not be taking place in 2017. This is now, there's now a real risk that this important event will be lost from the motor racing calendar permanently, which will be a big blow to the Borders economy. I would urge the First Minister and the Scottish Government to do all it can to provide support to the Jim Clark rally. But specifically, will the First Minister clarify today that the ongoing inquiry does not in itself provide any legal obstacle to the holding of the rally and urge the Motorsports Authority to look again at its decision not to grant a permit to the rally? First Minister. Well, I am happy to write to the member in more detail with a, a full answer to, to that question to make sure that he gets all the information uh, he needs, particularly around the, the legal position. My understanding um, is that it is the governing body uh, who has uh, taken the decision not to hold the rally uh, this year. I can understand that that will be a great disappointment to those who enjoy uh, that event, although there are also uh, given uh, past incidents at that event uh, have been uh, legitimate and understandable concerns about safety, which have been the subject, uh, as the member is aware, uh, of reports. We will continue to do all we reasonably can to support those who want to ensure uh, the safe conduct of this event in future. These events are uh, not just uh, matters of enjoyment to followers of the sport, but can be uh, very beneficial to local economies as well. So I'll make sure uh, that further information around the, the detail of this is provided uh, to the member and the government will continue to do what we can to liaise with uh, the Jim Clark uh, rally organisers to uh, make sure that we're providing any reasonable assistance that we can do. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. <clears throat> Thank you. Can I add to the general wishes for a good new year to everybody and ask the First Minister when the Cabinet will next meet? First Minister. Uh, the Cabinet will next meet on Tuesday. Patrick Harvey. Some of the people who may not have a happy new year are those who are going to be affected by the UK government's new benefit cap. Over recent months, we've put in a number of questions on this issue about the people in Scotland, the households and families in Scotland, who will be affected by that savage reduction in welfare, some of them losing well over £100 a week. And I know that the Scottish government opposes that UK policy and shares our concern about it. But in asking those questions, it's become very clear that the Scottish Government doesn't have a clear understanding of the number of households who will be affected. Its own previous estimates suggested 4,000 households. DWP figures suggest it could be 5,000. External organisations have put it at 6,700 or even up to 11,000 households in Scotland, with some 20,000 children affected by those cuts. Does the First Minister agree with me that it's vital that we get an accurate assessment of the number of people who will be affected by these cuts and the ways in which they are going to be affected if we are going to have any chance to give them the support that they need with the new powers that are coming to the Scottish Parliament. First Minister. Uh, yes, I do. I, I agree with that very much. Patrick Harvey uh, will be aware, I know he is aware because it was part of his question, that the Scottish Government uh, is seeking to do what we can to understand uh, those uh, and the numbers of those who will be affected by the benefit cap, but we are reliant to a large extent on information provided by the DWP to give accurate assessments around that. So we will continue to do what we can, but also to seek information from the DWP uh, in order that we can uh, give a, an accurate assessment, but also use such an accurate assessment to plan our own approach. There are also, which I won't go into in detail in the interest of time, but there are also other issues that we will have to uh, make sure that we have a, an understanding around with the DWP and the UK government. For example, when we have the uh, ability and use the powers to formally abolish the bedroom tax, for example, how that will interact with the benefit cap. Because on this or on any other issue, what we do not want to be in a position of giving with the one hand only for the UK government to be taking away uh, with the other. So these are complex issues, but at the heart of this is a very simple commitment on the part of the Scottish Government. We want to firstly uh, continue to do, as we have been doing, mitigate as far as we can the impact of unfair welfare changes being imposed by the UK Government, and secondly, make sure that as we take forward plans uh, for the use of our own powers, we put in place systems that are fair and have respect and dignity absolutely at their heart. Patrick Harvey. 
Well, I understand the complexity of the challenge, but it seems that the Chartered Institute of Housing and Sheffield Hallam, who've conducted external assessments, are not limited to DWP figures. They've shown that the impact will be much higher than the DWP is putting it at. So the Scottish Government does need to be able to work with them and any other organisations who can produce an accurate assessment. Can the First Minister give us some clarity about when that assessment will be conducted, when we'll have an accurate understanding of who is going to be affected, how many households will be affected and how they'll be affected. Because clearly the idea of a child poverty strategy is going to be uh, close to meaningless if we've not got a, got a clear understanding of the impact of these changes on child poverty in Scotland. And will the Scottish Government reconsider the option of a top-up to child benefit? Research has shown that even a modest £5 a week top-up to that benefit could lift as many as 30,000 children out of poverty in Scotland. First Minister. Well, in terms of the substance of how we will uh, use new powers, uh, some of our commitments, of course, were set out in the manifesto that we were elected on, um, and uh, the Green Party put forward uh, proposals which we will look at with interest, including uh, the one that he talks about. What we uh, said in our manifesto and what we are absolutely committed to doing is introducing the new Early Years Grant, which will provide increased uh, and better support uh, to families in the lowest income households uh, when they have uh, a child. Um, and we will continue that support, not just for the first child, but for uh, later children as well. So we are determined to use these powers in a way that helps us tackle child poverty. In the more general part of Patrick Harvey's question, I'm very happy to ask officials with uh, Angela Constance, the relevant cabinet secretary here, to meet with Patrick Harvey and his colleagues uh, to give him a fuller understanding of the work we are doing uh, to get those assessments I think he's right, I, and, and experience would uh, tell me that he's right, that the DWP estimates for the numbers of people affected by some of those changes tend to be, let's say, at the lower end of the spectrum, and we often find that there are more people affected. It is in our interest, as well as in the interest of the Chamber and the country as a whole, for us to properly understand uh, this situation. So if it would be helpful to Patrick Harvey, I'm uh, happy to uh, ask Angela Constance and officials to meet with him and his colleagues uh, in order that he can understand fully the work we're doing to try to get us into that position. Question number four, Willie Rennie. Uh, to ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Uh, matters of importance to the people of Scotland. Willie Rennie. Uh, the budget is coming up. The Scottish Government has received weekly warnings on the economy and on education. We have the risk of a hard Brexit. The OECD said Scottish education has gone from leading to just average. The IPPR warned about skills just this week. Small business confidence is falling. We are going to have to do something about this. I believe the First Minister needs to rise to the challenge by investing in education and skills to get our schools back up to the best, to train our people for work to boost the economy. As college funding has been cut in real terms by £90 million compared with seven years ago, wouldn't it be right for us, considering all those challenges, to reverse that cut in full? First Minister. Well, we've put forward a, a draft budget, as Willie Rennie knows, that does prioritise uh, the economy. That's important at all times. He's right to say it's particularly important given the challenges we face from Brexit. Uh, the budget also prioritises education. I couldn't have been clearer, and I will continue to be clear, about the importance we attach to education, raising standards and closing the attainment gap. Uh, that's why our attainment fund uh, will be £750 million across the life of this parliament. Uh, but that budget is a draft budget, uh, and as is uh, normally the case uh, when we are uh, passing budgets, we will discuss with others who want to discuss with us ways in which we can listen to uh, the suggestions that are put forward. Uh, so uh, I know the Finance Secretary has been discussing with other parties, and we will continue to do that. But be in no doubt, uh, the economy, education, our public services, continuing to make sure uh, that we take all of these things forward to equip Scotland uh, for the challenges that lie ahead will always be at the centre of all of our spending plans. Willie really, Rennie. Really. I'm afraid that answer fails to match the scale of the challenge that is before us. And that is why the Scottish Government has no majority for its budget. That £90 million cut from colleges has wiped out a whole sector of part-time courses, with the Royal Society of Edinburgh saying today a 48% reduction 
in part-time students in the last eight years. And that has primarily affected women and over 25-year-olds. The pupil premium for schools in England has delivered real change that allows everyone, no matter what their background, to participate in the economy. The Scottish Government's attainment fund plans are years behind and £70 million short of what is required to match that proven investment. Of course, other budget changes will be required, but we've seen decline in schools and we've seen decline in colleges. So will the First Minister reverse that decline and change her budget for the sake of our economy? First Minister. Well, we will continue to discuss with Willie Rennie and with others uh, suggestions that they have for amendments to the draft budget. That's how we always uh, conduct ourselves uh, when we are at this stage of a budget process. I, I would say to Willie Rennie, though, that week in and week out, what he is asking us to change about the draft budget seems to change. Uh, I think before Christmas, it was around mental health, uh, an area where I think we are in agreement that we require to do more. Uh, today, it's a, a range of other things. So we will continue to engage uh, on these matters, and the Finance Secretary's door is open to anybody who wants to have that constructive discussion. On the issue of the pupil equity uh, fund that was announced in the draft budget, uh, part of the Scottish Attainment Challenge will now see uh, £120 million uh, go direct to schools in the form of a pupil equity uh, fund, delivering extra to support to uh, pupils that come from more deprived backgrounds. That, I think, is a signal of our determination to close the attainment gap. So we've put forward a budget that I think has the right priorities, but of course we remain open to discussing the detail of that with any party that wishes to engage with that in a constructive way. And I know that Willie Rennie uh, and the Liberal Democrats will want to do so. Question number five, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on reports that there has been a record number of drink drivers stopped over the festive period. First Minister. Well, it's more than disappointing to see a rise in the number of drivers who flouted the law and put their lives and the lives of others at risk uh, over the festive period. Uh, there is only one safe level of alcohol if you're driving, uh, and that is none at all. Uh, unfortunately, data shows that the vast majority of those caught were not only over the new lower alcohol limit, but also over the previously higher limit. Uh, Police Scotland are taking action to catch those who put lives at risk by drink driving, especially the persistent hardcore uh, of drink drivers. And that's why they increased the number of checks carried out over the festive period compared to the year before. Stuart McMillan. I thank the First Minister for that response. And does the First Minister, like me, believe that these figures uh, highlight the amount of effort and resources Police Scotland are rightly directing towards road safety over Christmas and New Year? And also, does the First Minister commend Police Scotland and our emergency services in making our roads and communities safer? First Minister. Uh, well, yes, I do commend the police for their work in this area. Let me commend all of our emergency services for the work they did over the festive period to keep us all safe. Um, there's no doubt that the results of the festive drink driving campaign uh, demonstrate that Police Scotland are absolutely right to focus very clearly on those who drink and drive by taking the action necessary to catch those who are putting not just their own lives but the lives of others at risk by getting behind the wheel after drinking. Uh, during the four-week enforcement campaign, there was a, an average of 610 drivers tested every day, and that's a 15% rise in the number of checks that were carried out the year before. Uh, Assistant Chief Constable Bernie Higgins uh, said, and I absolutely agree with this, drivers need to take far greater personal responsibility and be aware that while this campaign is over, Police Scotland are still very focused on detecting and arresting drunk drivers. There is no excuse uh, for drunk driving. It does put the lives of those doing it at risk, and as I say, the lives of others at risk. And it is absolutely right that at the festive period and at all periods of time we all see how unacceptable it is and we get behind uh, Police Scotland and their efforts to eradicate it. Question number six, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to a recent BBC report suggesting that 90% of performance athletes supported by Sport Scotland come from a middle-class background. First Minister. 
Sport Scotland and its partners in local authorities, uh, the Scottish governing bodies of sport and clubs are committed to building a world-class sporting system for everyone, which has inclusivity and equal opportunities at its heart. Uh, the government has made very clear our determination to ensure that children from our poorest communities have the same opportunities as those from our richest, and this includes sport at every level, and our investments in facilities, our investments in PE at school underlines that drive and commitment. Brian Whittle. Uh, I thank the First Minister for that answer. Uh, would you agree with me that those performance athletes who have had the honour of representing their country in competition have done so because of hard work and dedication over a number of years, irrespective of background? And would you further agree with me that these figures highlight an inequality of opportunity that has yet to be addressed? And the answer is not to penalise those high achievers by withdrawing support, but to ensure that the same opportunities must be afforded to all, irrespective of background or personal circumstance, and starts with physical literacy opportunities at the earliest possible age as an integral part of an educational framework. First Minister. Uh, yes, I do actually uh, agree with that. It, it's probably a good opportunity to take uh, a moment to congratulate uh, Sir Andy Murray, uh, Dame Catherine Granger and of course Gordon Reid for uh, their recognition in the Queen's New Year Honours List uh, and everybody else who was uh, recognised. They are shining examples uh, of the success of Scottish sports. So yes, it's right that we continue to invest in elite sports and uh, I had the honour and it was a great honour of officially opening the new elite performance centre at Heriot Watt University just a matter of weeks ago, a sign of the investment in performance sport uh, that is taking place in this country. Uh, but it's also important that we support sport and physical activity at grassroots. Uh, the amount of PE in schools has increased dramatically over the years that this government has been in office. I'm also proud that we are supporting schools to do the daily mile in schools, which I think is a potentially transformational initiative for the health and fitness of our young people. And yes, it's right that we try to promote greater equality in opportunities for sport. And I would say, and this perhaps may be the only uh, discordant note in terms of uh, an area where I otherwise agree with Brian Whittle, if we want to encourage uh, more young people from deprived areas to take advantage of the opportunities of sport, then perhaps uh, you know, reducing the circumstances in which they're having, their parents are having to use food banks uh, or are being subject to benefit caps and welfare cuts would help with that. So let's all get behind making Scotland an even fitter nation. Yeah. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I note the First Minister's answer, but I don't totally agree, because I'll refer to the report by the Health and Sport Committee of 2009, entitled Pathways into Sport and Physical Activity. There's much to be learned from that report, but I'm going to quote from paragraph 268, which said, the international evidence that it is notoriously difficult to achieve a lasting legacy from sports events in particular, the transformation of grassroots sport and mass public participation. Recent comments have proved that we were right all those years ago. Yet I do have concerns that there's still too much focus and therefore funding directed towards the elite in sports. I recognise their achievements, but it's not all about medal count because we partially justify that by a supposed payback of that non-existent legacy. Can I therefore ask if the government and the First Minister will look at rebalancing funding to more grassroots, not to try to rely too much on that legacy, which has not happened? First Minister. Well, I, I do think it is, I suppose, a question of getting the balance right, but I don't think we should reduce uh, the support uh, that we give for uh, elite sports because you know, in many ways, it is the performance and the success of our elite sportsmen and women that will help to inspire young people uh, to take up sport and to take up physical activity. And I would say to Christine Graham, and I know she will agree with me in general on this, just because something is notoriously difficult doesn't mean you shouldn't try and do it in life. And I suspect there are many young people across Scotland who over the last couple of years have picked up a tennis racket because of the inspiration of Andy and Jamie Murray and Gordon Reid. Uh, they may not become the world-class players that these three are, uh, but nevertheless, that inspiration will have been important to them. So I think it's right that we support our elite sportsmen and women. But Christine Graham is right, indeed Brian Whittle was right, when uh, they say that we have to also uh, support grassroots 
facilities and participation. That's why part of the legacy of the Commonwealth Games was about increased facilities across the country. The uh, performance centre uh, that I spoke about at Heriot what just been one of many uh, new facilities and enhanced facilities across the country. So it's about getting the balance right so that we've got not just the sports success to celebrate, but also we are supporting a population that is generally becoming healthier and fitter. Neil Findlay. Um, how will the cutting the sport budget as proposed in the draft budget encourage more people in working class communities to engage in sport? First Minister. We, we, support, we support sport in many ways. Uh, for example, our investment, our, investment, our investment in facilities, our investment through uh, schools, sport, um, and our investment in uh, major events. So this is about the, the different ways in which we support uh, people who are taking part in activity. Uh, one of the things that I, I do think we have to do is get young people at a much earlier age into the habit of activity uh, and, and sport. That's why I mentioned it earlier on. The Daily Mile is such a simple thing, but such a potentially transformational thing. Because at a very young age, I was at a school in Edinburgh not that long ago, where it wasn't the primary school kids, it was the nursery school kids that were doing the Daily Mile. So all of these things taken together are vitally important. And frankly, whatever our political disagreements, all of us in the chamber should be able to get behind that. And question seven, Monica Lennon. Thank you. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to reports that hundreds of children with mental health problems have waited more than a year for treatment. First Minister. Well, it's unacceptable that any child uh, has to wait a lengthy period of time for mental health treatment. Uh, the Mental Health Minister has been very clear with health boards that any falls in uh, their performance or children experiencing long waits is not good enough. It is though, uh, and this is not intended to take away from uh, the comments that I've already made, but progress is being made. The number of patients who waited over 52 weeks uh, has decreased according to the figures we've got for the latest quarter. So there is work to be done. I've said much in this chamber before and I will say uh, much more, no doubt, in the weeks and months ahead about the importance of mental health care. There is much to be done, but progress is being made. Monica Leanne. I thank the First Minister for her answer. What I would have liked to have heard more of is what's been done jointly between the Mental Health Minister and the Education Secretary to jointly address this crisis that cuts across the classrooms and the health boards. I know the First Minister is aware that many young LGBTI people in schools are struggling with their mental health as a result of discriminatory bullying. The Thai campaign research shows that 95% of LG LGBTI people who have experienced bullying at schools see it as a long-lasting impact on their well-being. What assurances can the First Minister give that providing resources and education to tackle mental health problems will be central to the forthcoming mental health strategy and that the strategy will include specific actions for named vulnerable groups more at risk of poor mental health, something Bernardo's have asked for in their mental health uh, response? It's quite an important issue, but the First Minister has expressed support for the Thai campaign. Will she now commit to, to the Parliament that we will see legisl legislation coming forward in the lesson of this Parliament? Because it's such a serious issue and there's support right across the Chamber, but there's just no action coming forward. First Minister. Well, I think the member raises really important issues and I think she's done it in a very, very constructive way. And I would say, I, I don't think it's fair to say there is no action coming forward. I absolutely appreciate that she may think we should be doing more and doing it faster and that is legitimate. But I think there is a great deal of consensus around what we need to do here. She makes a point and I think it is a fair point about making sure there is, although we have rightly a dedicated mental health minister, it's not solely the responsibility of the mental health minister. And she makes a, a good point about the linkages between mental health and uh, education and health. And there is, and the strategy will uh, look at this, particularly in relation to education, the level before CAMS, underneath CAMS services, which is as much about prevention as it is about treating mental health uh, issues. Uh, she's also absolutely right to talk about the issues uh, that LGBTI young people can face because of uh, homophobic bullying. Uh, I've said before, and I will say again, I'm a supporter of the Thai campaign, not just in their objectives, but in the spirited way they go about uh, trying to make sure that their objectives are taken forward. There is a commitment to take forward uh, the uh, issues that they have uh, raised with the government. We will do that in 
consultation with them. Um, there's a lot of substance and detail in this across a whole range of different areas of government responsibility. Uh, and it's important that we get that right across all of these areas. The mental health strategy will be published uh, shortly. That then provides the, the direction of travel over the next period. And of course, that strategy is backed by significant additional resources for mental health. Spending on mental health services has increased uh, dramatically over uh, the course of uh, the last few years, but there is more funding needed supporting more services, not just in treatment, but in prevention. So I hope, genuinely hope, that while we'll have spirited debate about the detail of this, we can, as a parliament, get behind the actions that we need to take over the course of this parliament to make really substantial changes that will be to the benefit of young people across our country. Thank you. And that concludes First Minister's questions. Oh, so I have a point of order from Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Can I ask you if you consider it acceptable that inspired questions are used to make major government announcements, or would you expect the government to respect Parliament and allow proper scrutiny, including by backbenchers, of announcements um, such as the one on trauma centres? Can I, can I thank Elaine Smith for the, uh, the, the question? Uh, I don't think it's a point of order. However, she may be reassured to know that the uh, Parliamentary Bureau is looking at the whole issue of uh, the use of inspired parliamentary questions, and will do so at its next meeting. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. We move on to uh, members' business in the name of Colin Smith. We'll just take a few seconds to change seats. <laughs>